seeking to share the message of God's love with our city, the nation, and the world. Through radio, television, and a satellite network, we're reaching into over 40 states across the country through the ministry of the Hyde Park Hour. We invite you now to join us as we worship our Lord together through songs of praise and a message from the Word of God. Brought to us by our pastor, Dr. Ralph Smith. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My, what a joy it is to welcome you on this Lord's Day morning to Hyde Park Baptist Church. Would you join with me as we go to God in prayer, and then we're going to witness together the very beautiful ordinance of believers' baptism. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Lord's Day that reminds us of the conquest of death by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that we can come on the first day of the week and give you our worship, praise, and adoration. And I pray, God, that you would help each one of us to recognize that we are mere mortals, we are human beings, we make many mistakes, we often sin, and, Father, we need your forgiveness, and we ask that. We pray for that. We beseech you that you would cleanse us of sin and that you would free us from the things of the world that hinder us from being our best for God. Father, maybe there's somebody here today grappling with some problem in the home or the business world or maybe a problem with their health or their family, maybe some interpersonal problem. Help that individual to look to Christ, to turn to God, and to ask for your help and leadership. Father, we pray especially today that you would bless the graduating high school seniors in our church, and not in our church only, but throughout the city and the county and the nation. Bless these outstanding young people as they move on into the work world or into careers or into marriage or into colleges and universities to prepare themselves for professional service. Father, I pray that of the various paths they take, that they would always trust in the Lord with all of their heart, lean not to their own understanding, help them in all of their ways to acknowledge you, and help them to know that you will direct their path. And Father, we thank you not only for these young people, but we thank you for their parents, the homes from whence they come, the hours that have been spent with them. And I pray, God, that these teenagers would be grateful for what mom and dad, what the family has done. Now, Father, bring us together as a cohesive unit in this church and help us to be one body in Christ, witnessing and sharing the gospel with others. And if there is someone worshiping with us today here in the sanctuary or listening on the radio or worshiping through the medium of television who is not a Christian, I pray for that one person, that that individual would come to know Christ, trust him as Savior, and live for God. Now, Father, bless us. Meet our needs in Jesus. This is our prayer in the name of the one that we love, even our Savior. Amen. Rejoice with Whitney Liggett, his family, and his friends as he comes to Honor God's command. Obey Him in believer's baptism. Whitney, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He is buried with Christ in baptism, and He is raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. God bless you. We pray that others of you will come even this very day and give your heart to Jesus Christ. Will you join me now in a great song of praise that you will find at number 215 in your hymnal. We sing together. Majesty, 
worship his majesty. Good morning. You're sharing the services of Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin, Texas. We're so glad you could be here. We know that we have many guests in this service. Our ushers are coming forward. They have in hand some materials about Hyde Park Baptist Church. If you're a guest, let me ask you to raise your hand and keep it raised until they can find you and give you the material information about our church. Inside that packet is a card for you to fill out, if you would be so kind to do that so we might know that you are here today. Uh, let me thank you for doing that now and express our appreciation to you for coming to our services. We hope you had a good time in Bible study. Let me point out in your worship folder a couple of things. At 7 o'clock this evening in the chapel, our children's choir spring concert and a musical by the young musicians it is going to be great. You better come early to get a seat of beautiful sets and well-rehearsed music. I think you will be extremely pleased with the uh, performance and worship service tonight. Seven o'clock, we will meet in the chapel for that service. Vacation Bible School is coming, and we hope children from all over Travis County will be a part. It's June 13 through 17, uh, Monday through Friday of that week in the mornings. I hope you can help bring children from your neighborhood to a time of Bible study and fellowship. This year we have the Jerusalem Marketplace for grades five through six, which meets at the quarries. It's one of the finest programs of its kind in the United States. There's really nothing else like it. And so this is a great year for Bible school. I hope you will have uh, children here from ages four through sixth grade. And now let me ask, uh, Jimmy Myers, our minister to youth, to come. Uh, we congratulate our graduating seniors, and we now want to recognize them in a special way. Jimmy, come and say a word about them. Tell you what, it is a, it is a very special day in the life of our church when we get to recognize and congratulate the graduating seniors. It's a special day for quite a number of people. First of all, the parents. Those are the ones who are sitting around you whose buttons are about to pop from pride. Others of us have that problem for other reasons. But um, the parents of these graduating seniors today are swelling with pride. And not only the parents, but also those of you who worked with these children when they were in the nursery, or maybe you taught them in vacation Bible school. It really is a chance, guys, for the entire church family to say that we love you and that we're very, very proud of you. If the first row would like to come ahead and, and come on, the church is giving them a gift this morning of uh, evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell, a very excellent resource in Christian apologetics. When their faith is going to be challenged, and it will be challenged, he gives some uh, great intellectual and biblical responses for those challenges. Uh, they're also going to come this morning and tell you who they are, where they're graduating from, and their plans for the future. Pastor. Hi, my name is Victor Lowe. I'm graduating from High Park Baptist High School, and I'm going to UT Austin in the fall. Congratulations. 
Hi, I'm Lindsay Bowling, graduating from McNeil High School, and this fall I'll be entering the School of Visual Arts at the University of North Texas. Hi, my name is David Chan. I'm going to be graduating from Louisville High School, and uh, I plan on going to UT as well, and uh, majoring in biomedical engineering. Hi, my name is Micah Oglesby. I'm graduating from Anderson High School, and next year I'll be attending the, New the University of North Texas. Congratulations. My name is Jeffrey Benford, graduating from Pflugerville High School, and I plan to attend Blinn Junior College in the fall. My name is Lindsay Westbrook. I'm graduating from Westlake High School, and I probably will be attending ACC. Some classes. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm William Kurtz. I'll be graduating from the Science Academy at OBJ, and I'll plan to attend UT Austin. Congratulations. Hi, I'm Nicole Stacy. I'm attending Westlake High School, and I'll be graduating, and I will be attending U the University of Texas on a track scholarship in the fall. My name is Darren Oliphant. I'll be graduating from Liberty Hill High School, and I'll be attending Blinn Junior College in the fall. Hi, my name is Julie Ratzman. I'm graduating from Westwood High School, and I'll be attending Southwest Texas State in the fall and majoring in communications. My name is Rusty Kelly. I'm graduating from Hyde Park, and I'll be attending Vanderbilt University. My name is Lindsay Newman. I'll be graduating from Hyde Park Baptist High School and attending Baylor University in the fall. Congratulations. My name is Josh Tyres, and I will be receiving my diploma from ACC and attending Southwest Texas State on physical therapy in the fall. <coughs> Hi, my name is Ron Tu. I'll be graduating from Hyde Park High School and attending Baylor University in the fall. Hi, I'm Nancy Schreiber, and I'll be graduating from Hyde Park Baptist High School and attending Southwest Texas State University in the fall. Congratulations. My name is Jeff Lucas. I'll be graduating from Hyde Park High School and attending Baylor University in the fall. Congratulations, Jeff. Hi, my name is Kirsten Miller. I'll be graduating from Hyde Park and attending Southwest Texas University in the fall. Hi, my name is David Morgan, Jr. I'll be graduating from Hyde Park High School and attending Bayward University in the summer and the fall. <laughs> my name is Chris Morris. I'll be graduating from Hyde Park High School and, gra and attending Bailey University in the fall. Chris, congratulations. My name is Jorge Tovar. I'm graduating from w William B. Travis High School, and I'll be attending UT at Austin. Hi, my name is David Rowe. I'm graduating from Anderson High School. I'll be attending the University of Oklahoma and majoring in international business and playing football. Good for you. Hi, my name is David Moore. I'm graduating from Hyde Park. I'll be attending Baylor in the fall. My name is Jason Boatwright. Um, <clears throat> I'm graduating from Austin High School, and I'll be attending Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont in the fall. Hi, I'm Jennifer Ellison. I'll be graduating from Westlake High School and attending Texas A&M University in the fall. <laughs> I'm Ben Ballard. I'll be attending Baylor University in the fall, and I'll be graduating from Anderson High School before then. God bless you, man. Hi, I'm Persephone Lehman. I'm graduating from Pflugerville High School, and uh, hopefully I'm going to San Angeles State, majoring in ocean marine biology. Congratulations. My name is Grant Blevins. I'm going to be graduating from Science Academy at LBJ, and I'll be attending Stephen F. Austin State University. Hi, I'm Deborah McCartley, and I'm graduating from Hyde Park High School, and I will be attending the University of Texas in the fall. My name is Scott Fisher. I graduated from Pflugerville High School, and I will be attending University of Texas. Scott, congratulations. Hello, 
my name is Deborah Chan, and I'll be graduating from Lookerville High School, and I'll just leave my plans in God's hands. I'm undecided right now. I'm Gary Spear. I'll be graduating from Westwood High School, and I hope to attend the University of Texas this fall. Hi, I'm Brent Gallion. I'll be graduating from McNeil High School and most likely attending ACC in the fall. Hi, I'm Brian Boyd. I'll be graduating from Westwood High School and attending Baylor University in the fall. I know that uh, all of us are so proud of our graduating high school seniors, and not just ours, but uh, others all over the city. And we want again express our thanksgiving to you parents, grandparents, family members that no doubt have encouraged them, sacrificed for them, pray for them, and love them. And we are proud of every one of you. Could we give them a hand, please? You praise the Lord with us now as we sing together, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. If you need these words, you'll find them at 253. Would you stand as we sing it together now?
Coming at this time to lead our off to our prayer is Mr. Robert Jones. Bob, come and lead us in our prayer, please. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into thy house to hear thy word taught. Be with this servant, Ralph Smith, as he brings this morning message. May we have open hearts and minds to what your word says. Lord, we pray for this choir, and we thank you for them that add so much to this service each time we meet. Lord, we thank thee for the staff members of this church that keep this organization in full, full swing. We thank you for the workers behind the scenes, Lord, the people in the nurseries that teach Sunday after Sunday so faithfully. Guide us and direct us through this coming week, and we'll give you all the praise. Bless these tithes and offerings now to further your kingdom's work. For it's in thy name we pray. Amen. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed his name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian and take him with Take him with you everywhere. 
Thank you, Joe, for that beautiful message in song. May I invite you to open your Bible this morning to the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, and we want to begin reading at verse 17 down to verse 29. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered and said unto him, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought unto Jesus, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, and he wallowed, foaming. And he asked the father, How long ago since this came unto him? And he answered, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter into him no more. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes on the magnificent power of belief. You can search through all of the Bible, and you'll never find a more inspiring, encouraging statement than the one that Jesus made to this father when he said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. In the realm of the natural, seeing is believing. But in the realm of the spiritual, Believing is seeing. It was St. Augustine who said, Faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. Jesus inspired all of those statements when he said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Whatever your needs are this morning, if you can believe in Jesus Christ, commit those needs to him, the promise of the Bible is that all things are possible. Now, faith means that we see the invisible. Faith believes the incredible, and faith receives the impossible. Doubt sees the obstacles, and faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night, but faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step, but faith soars on high. Doubt questions who believes, and faith answers, it is I. Mark the Evangelist tells us one of the most inspiring incidents out of the life of Christ. Jesus took three of his disciples, Peter, James, John. He led them up to a place that we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, you can go to Israel today, and there is no mountain named the Mount of Transfiguration. We're not quite sure which one it was. The evangelists do not tell us. Either Mount uh, Nebo or Mount Tabor. We're not quite sure which. Well, when they got to the top of the mountain, Jesus began to pray with the disciples. And the disciples were just as human as you and, and uh, I. The disciples, in the midst of the prayer time, fell asleep. 
While they were asleep, Jesus was transfigured. That word transfigured is the word metamorphosis. In other words, when people saw Jesus while he was here on the earth, they saw a human being. But inside that human being was God. And all of a sudden, the glory of God came through the outer flesh of Jesus, and the Bible says he was transfigured. He went through a metamorphosis. And the brightness of Jesus was like the brightness of the noonday sun. Well, the disciples suddenly were awakened. And as they saw Jesus in all of his resplendent glory of heaven, they saw by his side Moses and Elijah come down from heaven, back from the dead, standing there talking to Christ. Well, their hearts began to race. They became very excited. And all of a sudden, Simon Peter blurted out, Lord, it's good to be here. We're going to build three tabernacles, three temples. We're going to build one for you and one for Moses, representing the law, one for Elijah, representing the prophets. As soon as Peter said that, Moses and Elijah disappeared. God wants us to look at Jesus only, not the law, as magnificent as it is, nor the prophets, as great as they were. And God spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. What an experience. The transfiguration of Christ. Seeing Moses and Elijah come back from the dead. Have you ever thought about the fact that Many of us have questions, will we know our loved ones in heaven who have died and gone on before us? Here are Moses and Elijah. They come back from the dead, and Peter, James, and John immediately recognize them. Now, they didn't have uh, any television or moving pictures or photography in that day. That's a picture of the fact of the coming kingdom that we'll know our loved ones in heaven, and it's a an assurance that there is life beyond death. What a mountaintop experience, the Mount of Transfiguration. You ever been on a mountaintop? It's a good thing to get on top of a mountain. The difficulty is you can't stay there. All of us go from the mountain to the valley and from the valley to the mountain. Now, I know you think it would be wonderful, and certainly I do too, if we could just stay on top all of the time, nobody, no business, no home, no individual, no one's health stays on the mountain all the time. And so here are the disciples. They go down in the valley, and immediately they are confronted with a desperate father. He comes running to Jesus, and he said, Lord, if you can do anything, please help me. I've gone to your disciples. They can do absolutely nothing. Look at my son. He is possessed by a demon. He cannot hear. He cannot speak. He is insane. He has so little control of himself under the possession of this demon and with his insanity that sometimes he throws himself into the fire and we don't know what to do with him. We're so desperate. Master, if you can do anything, please help my son. Jesus looked at him and took that word if and turned it right back around. And he said, If you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Believe. I admire the Father. He didn't say, Lord, I have great faith. I'm a better believer than anybody here. I don't have any doubts at all. He made an honest statement. Honesty is such a good policy. He said, Lord, that word means God. He said, Jesus, you're my God. Lord, I do believe. But then he added, help thou my unbelief. That's the way that often our faith is. There's a little bit of mixture of doubt with our faith. The Bible tells us that when he said that to Jesus, Jesus immediately healed the boy. And they thought that the boy was dead. Jesus said, he's not dead. And he reached down, and the Bible says, Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. I've always looked at that statement and said, that's something that every person in the world can do. If you can't sing in the choir, 
or stand in the pulpit and preach, or if you can't stand up and direct a Sunday school class, or if you're a little timid and you couldn't be an usher, or you're not talented enough to play the piano or the organ, I tell you what you can do. You can preach the gospel with your hand. Jesus took him by the hand. I read in the Bible when Jesus healed a woman who had been ill most of her life, he took her by the hand. I read in the Bible that when Jesus healed a blind man, he took him by the hand and lifted him up. The Bible says that when Jesus cleansed the leper, he touched him and took him by the hand. And when the daughter of Jairus was uh, brought back from the dead, Jesus reached out his hand and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Would you preach the gospel with your hand? When people come to church and you don't know them, would you assume that they are a visitor? And would you introduce yourself to them? And you welcome them and make yourself a committee of one to welcome everyone that walks into our classes, into our church, into our fellowship. There may be one in a thousand that won't appreciate it, but all of the rest will love you if you will preach the gospel with your hand. There are those that are lonely. Would you reach out a hand of friendship? There are those that are doubting. Would you reach out a hand of goodwill? There are those that have walked recently through the veil of sorrow. Would you extend to them a hand of sympathy? And there are those that are bowing down neath a load that they cannot carry. Would you reach out to them a hand of strength and encouragement? And there are those that are facing great temptations, and they seem to be losing the battle. Would you stretch out your hand as a hand of deliverance? And there are those that are in the 11th hour, and they are on the verge of decision, either for God or against God, and would you reach out to them a hand of love and encouragement to bring them into the kingdom of God? Preach the gospel of Christ, and the way to preach it is to preach it with your hand, your hand of love and encouragement and of friendship. When our Lord had healed this boy, and the disciples and Jesus were walking away. The disciples said to the Lord, Lord, you've given us the power to heal. Uh, why couldn't we heal that boy? We've healed other people. And Jesus responded to them, this kind of healing or this kind of power only comes about by prayer and fasting. Maybe today we would read it prayer and total dedication to God. So for a few minutes, I want to talk to you on this magnificent power of belief that I think can transform your life and do miracles in your experience if you and I can learn more steadfastly how to live by faith. Now, the way you begin is to first put your faith and your trust steadfastly in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's a father... And he is so frustrated, he doesn't know what to do. He's frustrated with his family. His boy is disappointing him. He's ill, possessed of a demon, and insane. He is frustrated because he has gone probably to every doctor, and they have done their utmost, and the boy is still sick. He is frustrated because he has even gone to the church. He went to the disciples. And he said to the church, could you help me? And the church could do nothing. Finally, the man comes to Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus does what family or church or the most professional technical people of that day were unable to do. Would you notice that the father put his total trust in Jesus Christ? Maybe you have some problem in your life right now. It could be like this dad, a child. It could be like this father, a family problem. It could be that you have an illness like this dad faced an illness. It could be that you're at the end of the rope. You've tried every area to find a solution, and there seems to be none. Put your faith firmly in Christ. He can do 
what I can't do, the church can't do, the world can't do, only God can do. You know, the problems of life are not stop signs. They are simply guide signs. And if you're having a difficulty that seems impossible of solution, you are never defeated until you give up on your patience. And remember that if you have prayed and nothing has happened, that God's delays in your life are not God's denials. And here was a dad who had tried everything, but finally he came to the one person who has all power in heaven and in earth, Jesus Christ. Have you ever come to that person? I mean, trusted him as your Savior. I mean, given him your business. I mean, turned over your home to him. I mean, said, God, take care of my children. I don't know what to do with them. I mean, you said, God, here's my health problem. I turn it completely over to you. Now, the interesting thing about this whole episode is that Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, and the Gospel writer tells us that they talked to Jesus about his decease at Jerusalem. In other words, they're encouraging Christ because right now he is going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. So here is our Lord on his way to Jerusalem to redeem the world. But here is a desperate daddy with a desperate son, and Jesus stops and helps him. You know, what you and I do with our problem is a lot more important than what our problems are doing to us. And this father learned a great lesson, and that is that after the night, there comes the day. After the winter, there comes the springtime. After the storm, there comes the sun-tossed earth. And after sin, there is always forgiveness. And after defeat, there is always another chance. And Jesus stops to help this one individual when he has the redemption of the world on his heart and mind. Now, I just pause there to chase a little rabbit, and here it is. There are some people who can cope with the biggest problems life can throw at them. I mean, you face surgery, you roll right through it. A loved one dies, oh, you have grief, but you come right on. But notice Jesus. He not only can take care of the big problems, he's going to redeem the world. He can deal with the little problems. These same people that can deal with health and surgery and death lose all their patience if the waitress doesn't get the meal to the table on time. A little thing. These same people that can cope with the big problems, if someone's five minutes late for an appointment, they're so frustrated they hardly know what to do. Be sure as you deal with the big problems of life, and they're going to come, that you don't let the little problems of life defeat you and destroy you. And here is a father, one man. Jesus is going to redeem the world, but this one man is supremely important to Jesus Christ. I remember reading some time ago about a marvelous Jewish man who was hiding during the dark days of World War II in Poland, and he was living down in a basement. He was afraid the Nazis would come and perhaps take him off to his uh, death, at least a concentration camp. Uh, when finally the war was over and he came out of the basement, someone went down to look into the basement and they found this written on the basement wall. I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. And I believe in love even when I don't feel it. And I believe in God even when he is silent. When the situation of your life seems hopeless, keep hoping. Remember, faith in Christ can defeat any difficulty you and I have, that is the magnificent power of belief. Now, let me say a second thing, and that is this. The spirit of faith is the spirit of possibility that dwells in each of our hearts. You have this situation. You say, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. The spirit of possibility is the spirit of faith. Here is a dad... He's in a hopeless situation. He's tried everything. His son is insane. That'd be bad enough. His son is deaf. That's worse. His son can't speak. That's still worse. And more than that, his son is possessed with a demon, and things are so bad that nobody can control this boy. He tries to throw himself in the fire. He's tried again and again to commit suicide, but the father never gave up. He kept going to doctors and friends, 
and disciples and the church, and finally he comes to Jesus Christ. I, your situation, that little problem, that big problem, that medium-sized problem you face, it seems to be hopeless. Don't give up, for the spirit of faith is the spirit of possibility. I read just this week about a man who went blind. I think that that would be difficult. And when he went blind, he had great fears. But after he was blind for a year, he wrote about the experience, and he said, you know, now that I'm blind, I have learned to overcome that difficulty. He said, when I could see, I would see someone wearing a new style, and I would covet it. I don't do that anymore. He said, when I could see, I would see someone who was handsome, and I considered myself rather ugly, and I don't envy them anymore. He said, it's really not that bad being blind. He said, do you realize that most of the joys that we have in life come when our eyes are closed? He said, when you kiss the one you love, don't you close your eyes? And when you're really enjoying beautiful music, don't you close your eyes to get the fullness of the sound? And when you pray, don't you close your eyes so that you can see God in your blindness? He said, don't feel sorry for me. I'm all right. That's the spirit of faith. It's the spirit of possibility in the midst of impossibility. And Jesus repeats this universal truth, and that is that if you and I believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Convor once said, faith is a sense of the possible. Now, I thought about this as I thought about talking to you this morning, and I said, Ralph Smith, what is it that keeps you having this magnificent power of belief that you want the congregation to have that will lift their lives on a higher level? And I thought of three things in my life that sometimes keeps me from having the kind of faith and belief and hope that I need to have. I think they're rather common. The first is worry. What I want to do in my life to have more faith is to whip worry. Worry can cause mental illness. Worry can cause you great pain and suffering. Do you realize that during World War II, the United States of America lost 300,000 of its finest men in the battlefield? And at that same period of time, a million people died in the United States because of heart attack, many caused by worry. I read where one doctor said worry can cause heart trouble, high blood pressure, ulcers, migraine headaches, and a host of stomach disorders. Have you ever been sick because you worried about something? A psychologist made an analysis of the worries that people had, and when he came from this study, he said, 40% of the things that you and I worry about never happen. Now, if it wasn't worth coming to church for any other reason, I just got rid of 40% of all your worries. Folks, they're not going to happen. And then he found out that 30% of the things that you and I worry about, we can't change anyway. I just got rid of 70% of all your worries. Do you realize that? They're not going to happen. Number two, if they're going to happen, you can't do anything about it. Number three, he said we have needless worries about health. 12% of our worries are in that category. And then he didn't know where to group some of them, so he called them petty and miscellaneous worries, 10%. But here's the bottom line. He said of the worrying that most people do, only 8% are real problems. What you and I need to do is to say 92% of the time when I'm worrying, I need to quit it. It's just pointless. I'm going to whip worry. How do we whip worry? We whip worry by believing the teachings of the Word of God. Listen to what God's Word says. Don't worry about anything, whatever. Tell God every detail in your need in earnest and thankful prayer. And the peace of God that transcends human understanding will keep constant guard over your hearts and minds as they rest in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 through 8, the Phillips translation. 
The psalmist said in Psalm 37, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. What a promise. Trust in the Lord. Number two, do the right thing. Don't just say, well, I'm trusting the Lord. Live right. You know, a lot of folks say, well, I really believe in God, and they act like the devil. They're, they're not Christians. You can tell by the way they live. You've got to trust in the Lord, and you've got to prove to yourself you trust in the Lord by doing good. And the result is, so shalt thou dwell in the land. God is going to take care of you. Harold Sherman tells the story of P.T. Barnum. When I was a little kid, I never missed a Barnum and Bailey circus that came to Hot Springs, Arkansas. I made them all. That was the most exciting thing that ever came to town. I remember that. One night, P.T. Barnum was awakened. At that time, he had joined with Mr. Bailey, the Barnum and Bailey Circus. They had the biggest circus in the world. And as he was awakened, the man said, Mr. Barnum, a fourth of the circus has burned up. And Barnum said, well, have they got the fire under control? He said, yes, sir, but did you hear me? We lost a fourth of the circus. Mr. Barnum said, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. There's nothing I can do about it till tomorrow. I'm going back to sleep. And he did. Now, I wish I could have that kind of faith, the kind of faith that says, if I can't do anything about it, if it's something beyond my control, if it's something that's needless, if it's something that's petty, I'm just going to whip worry, and the way I'm going to do it is trust God. Number two, fear. That keeps us from having faith. You need to fight your fears. You know, this father had fears. Jesus said, do you believe I can do something? He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. There's that fear coming in. Someone said, fear knocked at the door. And when faith answered, no one was there. What do you fear? Many years ago, I read a lot of books by a man named Napoleon Hill. And Napoleon Hill said, we have seven basic fears. I don't know if these are all inclusive, but it's a pretty good list. He said, here are the things that you and I fear. Number one, the fear of poverty. Number two, the fear of criticism. Number three, a fear of ill health. Number four, a fear of loss of love. Number five, a fear of old age. Number six, a fear of loss of liberty. And number seven, a fear of death. One thing I know, and that is when you and I face the fears of life, if we can learn to relax, 75% of the fear disappears. And so if you in your fears will say, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to lean not to my own understanding. I'm going to acknowledge him. 75% of your fears will be gone. Number three, doubts. We not only worry and have fear, but we have doubts. Now, doubt is the vestibule of the mind that leads into the temple of wisdom. And this father had doubts. He said, Lord, I believe, but... But I doubt, help thou my unbelief. And sometimes we have to doubt to get to a problem. That's the way we solve it. But I'm talking about a kind of doubt where you doubt God, you doubt people, you doubt your ability, you doubt you're going to heaven, you doubt that your prayers are being answered. You need to dominate your doubts. And the way that you do that is say, God, I trust you with all of my heart. That's the magnificent power of belief. Now, I know what you're doing. You're saying, well, Pastor, I, I, I just need more faith. How do I have faith? Let me give you four things about that in the final closing remark. Number one, faith is dependent on us. Jesus said, now listen to him, if thou canst believe. You say, well, I don't have much faith. Then you don't want much faith because you're the one that makes that decision. Faith is dependent on on you. Number two, the Bible says that we're to trust God in every area of life. I make the decision whether or not I'm going to have faith. And number two, I need to do it in every area of life. Jesus said, all things are possible to him that believe. All things. Are you trusting all things to God? Number three, if I want to have greater faith, the way I have this greater faith is to realize as I put my faith in God, I have the very power of God. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. 
nothing beyond the realm of possibility except that which is beyond the realm of the will of God for your life. Now, please don't misquote me. Nothing beyond the realm of possibility except that which is beyond the realm of the will of God for your life. And that opens great doors of opportunity. And finally, please remember this, the most important point. I've saved it to last. The fourth point about having faith. In order to have faith, it doesn't require perfect faith. God does not require perfect faith. This father said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. You know, very often when we pray to God or trust Christ for salvation, there's a little bit of doubt. All businessmen will tell you that are successful that you have to make decisions when you only have 70 to 80% of the facts in your hand. We never get 100%. If you wait, the deal's going to go sour. It's going to go south. It's, you're waiting too long. The same thing is true in our faith in God. We're never going to get all the facts. But if we can exercise this faith and say, God does not require all the facts or perfect faith. Lord, I believe. I know I have doubts, Lord. Help my unbelief. But Lord, I believe. Faith doesn't have to be perfect. As a matter of fact, it's not the faith. It's the person you put the faith in. If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to mountains to be removed and it'll be done. The point is not our faith. The point is the object of our faith, Almighty God. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. That's the magnificent power of belief in Jesus Christ as you put your trust and faith firmly in God. Now there's some of us here this morning that need to do that and become a Christian. Give your heart to Christ. Believe in him. Be saved. There are some of us that need to do that this morning and be baptized. You've never taken that step of obedience. There are some of us that need to do that this morning and join the church by statement or promise of letter. Would you say, Lord, I'm going to believe and I'm going to commit my life to you? And above all, the graduating seniors need to live by these teachings we have talked about this morning. It's faith that's going to lead into your career, your marriage, your college, your business, and your success. And if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Thank you for watching the Hyde Park Hour. This program comes to you from the Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin, Texas. Pray with us that this ministry will continue to encourage believers and win others to Christ. This is...
commencement service of the class in 1994 at Hyatt Park Baptist High School. Proud of these young men and women. And I know they're here because you love them and I'm proud of them. And I want to acknowledge uh, some who have made this evening possible. First and foremost, the moms and dads, the parents of these graduates. Uh, we want to thank you for your investment in their lives. And I know you're uh, uh, feeling some mixed emotions this evening your son or your daughter experiences this, but it's a happy hour. And I wonder if you're the mom or dad of one of these, would you please stand? Uh, we want to thank you for the wonderful thing you've done. We're so grateful for our parents and the love they poured into our lives. And I hope to see you. Graduates will express again uh, your gratitude to your mom and dad for all that they've done for you that you really can't imagine until you get older and maybe have children of your own. Uh, you'll begin to understand what they have done for you. Now, besides parents, there are grandparents and other family members. I'd like to acknowledge you. Would you please stand? If you're the grandparent or other family member of one of these, would you please stand?
been said that uh, the only good commencement address is a short one. See, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting applause for that. Probably the case. So you listen fast. Trust 
them again. But we don't stay shackled to them all of our lives. Then another thing you want to do is forget the victories and successes of the past. You say, now wait a minute, some of those things are really good. I want to hold on to them. Yeah, the memory is good, but you can't rest on past morals. Past successes won't do for tomorrow. You're going to have to forget those things and move on to new victories, new successes. And sometimes people are prone to live in the past, the good old days. They think about things that were good, successful, but and they're crippled for the future. They never move out of that. They continue on as, uh, as though they were still in that phase of their life. Haven't you heard of people who just never seem to grow up? They're still like they were in high school. We're supposed to forget those things, even though they were great, and move on. Some of the greatest victories you have pale in significance to the victories you're going to have in the future. So don't think you've had enough at this point. You haven't had. There are many other successes out there. When you go off to college or you go into the workforce, you're going to find out that there are people out there that have great talents and great abilities you never had met before. Competition's fierce out there. And uh, if you think competition was tough here in grades or athletic events or whatever, that's, that's not near what you're going to face. So victories are out here for those that press on. And, and who do not depend on their past laws. So forget your victories and successes. Now, the second thing Paul says, not only did he say forget the past, he said to press on. And you know, as I think about the word press on and the way he said it, it seems to me Paul has said, aggressively attack the future. We have, and we were just talking earlier, I, I believe we've probably got 75% of our society, and that's just a guess, who are really just reactionaries. They just bend with the wind. Whatever's going on around them, they react. They hardly ever take an aggressive step forward. They're pushed by this crowd, or that crowd, or this force, or that force. Paul is saying, press on, aggressively attack the future. Have dreams, have aspirations, have uh, desires, and press on to accomplish those with the Lord's help and guidance. Now, Paul says that he was pressing on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? It means finding the will of God in your life, in every aspect of that life. Now, think with me a minute. If I'm really able to forget the past, and all of its victories or failures or sins, and I'm, I'm focused on the future, and I press on, and I find the will of God in every area of my life, then I'm going to have happiness because I'm going to be right where God wants me to be. And Paul said, I keep pressing toward that. He said, I haven't attained that. He said, I'm not perfect. I'm still trying to find the will of God. But there are some areas where he says we ought to press. I thought of several. You have a vocational life out ahead of you. You have talents, and special gifts, and energy, and aptitude for certain things. And you're going to need to know where you where you fit. God's perfect plan for you. Press on to find that. You're going to want to uh, establish a home someday. Press on to find God's choice for you, a mate, so that you'll have your family, and it'll be a happy home. And that takes finding the will of God in that regard. Then press on in your daily walk with the Lord. When you stumble and fall along the way, He gives you a second chance. I know some of you who have had second, third, fourth chances. I have too. God will give you second chances, third chances. What if, what if you never had a, but one chance in life? Just one chance when you were a little baby and you, your parents put you on the floor to crawl and then to walk and you stumbled and 
characteristic of the class is the academic talent of the class. I think that, as I recall, the classes over the last several years, this class would rank as one of the top class academic. Probably they have more students with 90 plus averages than any other class in recent years. Several of the graduates have received admissions to prestigious universities, such as Baylor and Vanderbilt and a number of other institutions. So the academic talent is very strong in coming at this time to bring our talent to the forefront is our valedictorian for the class of 1994. That young man is Seth Jones, who is the son of Dr. Edmises Kenneth Jones. We're so proud of Seth, and he's wonderful. Hit an 
hitting the park home run, swing by an outfielder, doing whatever else the coach has to do. But if Brent would be completely nonchalant about practice that week, no matter how big the game was, he could outrun the entire St. Michael's football team. And then Jeff Lucas would always have a good excuse about why he only had three sacks. We knew that our beautiful prancers would always win the halftime contest with a show that the team would never get to see. <laughs> and our faithful cheerleaders would yell for us in 